Because the Rangers have so many offensive needs, should they be concerning themselves with coming up with a haul for David Price? My feeling is always that you can, if you, you can prevent a lot of runs. If the Rangers become the best run for Rangers team in the league, and they were very good at it already, that's fine. You know, and you can win with a pitching and defense team and not much hitting. So that's. Yeah, sure, hitting is a bigger need, but I don't look at it that way. If they have a chance to get price, you just take the chance and you go for it. So uh, J.D. and Friedman are very similar. They're just going to look at the best opportunity. If the, Maybe they go out in the open market and the best available free agent is Chu. Chu smokes right-handed pitching. Also, he well, certainly in center, but even in right, he's not a great defender. He doesn't hit lefties at all. He's getting older. He's a great on-base guy. I like him as a player, but I wouldn't spend a hundred and whatever million dollars. I don't think he's that good. And if that's the alternative, or you could do this and get David Price, then maybe you have to think about David Price. Right. Go ahead. In the last couple of years, the Astros have hired a couple of baseball writers into their front office. Recently, they just hired. Them. I guess uh, Goldstein and Wires. Uh, do you think that'll be a growing trend in baseball? And a follow-up, I guess, is that something you would ever be interested in if that were offered to you? <laughs> I cannot tell you how unqualified I am to work in a front office. Come on. I, these, Colin Wires and Kevin Goldstein and James Click and these people are so smart, and they have such different skill sets. Like, I am a, I went to journalism school. I'm a writer, so let's dispense with that part. The other part, sure, and it's still happening there are people that have lower profiles that you might not know about with prospectus or fan graphs or whatever who are getting hired all the time. It's just, and sometimes teams don't even report it. Uh, when I was writing the Rays book, they had a guy named Josh Kalk who did really cool stuff and he was doing, uh, writing about it in the public or whatever. They wouldn't put him on the masthead after they'd hired him because they didn't want anybody to know that he was working for them. Teams do that all the time. There are stat heads that you don't, right now, do not know are working for teams. A lot of them. Teams are super secretive and weird about it. So it'll continue to happen and teams will continue to be surreptitious about it because they feel like it's a competitive edge. Because the thing is, I, I don't know if you know this, baseball mo most baseball writers make either crap money or no money. If a team comes to you and says, we'll give you similar money or maybe even more and you're going to work for a baseball team, of course you want to. Aside from the fact that it's a cool job, everybody's going to want to do it. So they're in the driver's seat. If they make any kind of competitive offer, and I'm not, I don't want to speak for all baseball writers, but it's a very attractive thing for somebody to want to do. So like if, if somebody said, hey, Rick Riley, come work for the uh, te Texas Rangers uh, analytics department, do respect to Rick Riley, but Rick Riley is a well-compensated writer. He'd say, I don't want to do your scouting department. I'm fine here at ESPN. So it just it depends on who the person is. But most of the people that you would think of as a good candidate are just not spectacularly well compensated and don't have the, the opportunities maybe that you would have working for a team. So it's a great, aside from the fact that it's good for the team, I think it can be good for the writer too. It would be better if, like if KG were here or whatever, I'm sure he could speak to it better than I could, but I get the impression that it's just a, it's a great opportunity and a good mix for both sides. Do you think the other sports are catching up to where baseball, like John Hollinger took a job with the Grizz for example and uh, do, you, do you think that the other sports are catching up to where baseball is in terms of incorporating analytics, or is it still a pretty wide gulf? If any team takes a run at Zach Lowe, I will tell Granlin to take my salary and give it all to Zach to keep Zach. We're, no, but nobody's poaching Zach. It's not happening. Other Zach than, actually had the best uh, interview with Dirk I've ever read. The one in, yes. uh, on Grantland last March or April. He got stuff out of Dirk that none of the local guys have ever gotten out of Dirk. If you're like an aspiring sports writer in this crowd, just be like Zach Lowe. He's like a superstar. It's ridiculous. And anyway. he wasn't even a basketball guy growing up. He was like a writer that worked his way into the NBA. He wasn't a sports writer to yeah. start. Amazing guy. But anyways, do, do, sure. do you think the other leagues are catching up or is it? Yeah. Well, um, I love basketball. And if I was unemployed right now and I could do anything, I, it would be intriguing to want to take a shot at trying to get into that field of wanting to do what Zach does or what a lot of people in that field do. I think it's really interesting what's going on, and I think it creates opportunity. Teams see what's happening, and there are kids coming out of college, and they uh, – forget PER. They really understand advanced stats. And now we have sport view, like we have it, like pitch FX equivalents yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. So they're starting to understand spatial relationships in basketball and all this. So I think it's going to increase. I think that you're going to see this happen more frequently. The Celtics revamp – I'm a Celtics guy for what it's worth. And they revamp their whole front office. Uh, my dad was a Celtics fan. What do you want? <laughs> and uh, so – 
they hired Brad Stevens, a very analytical coach, but they hired a guy named Drew Cannon. Drew Cannon used to sit on the bench and was like unknown what he did, but he did like cool stat stuff. He's 23 years old wow. and he's working in the NBA in a substantial job. There, He's a very smart guy. Not everybody's that smart, but there are going to be other opportunities for people. So definitely. I can't speak to football as well, but I will just say that there have been overtures from teams to statistically minded football writers that you've probably heard of in the not too distant past. So yes, this is something that has happened and will happen even more in the future. Sure, absolutely. Jump in. All right. Uh, first off, thanks Augustine for having us out tonight. Fantastic um, round table here to talk, talk yeah. some baseball. Give it up. And Chuck, appreciate you coming out. And Jonah, it's nice, nice meeting you and talking to you. We've been talking a lot of stats and numbers all night. Let's get into some, some mind control. As a guy who flew to St. Louis for game six and Seven, we ever going to see Feliz being a closer again? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I could see that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't – well, Nelly Cruz – I mean, if Nelly Cruz was a decent, decent right fielder, then you have a World Series. I, I mean, I will go to my wow. grave thinking that he was cheating up because he wanted to jump on the pile. I've got a picture with three of one count. That, that shows was, him there. And, that, oh, was Buckner 80, that was Buckner me. 86 in terms of a, leaving a guy yeah. in the game. Anyway. Un unbelievable. Uh, yeah, you know, F yeah, Feliz blew it or whatever. I, I'm, I don't, I'm not a psychologist. I can't speak to Feliz's state, absolutely. But I don't, I think the Rangers are always willing to explore options. And if that's when the best one available to them to do that, I think they're going to have a lot of options for closing. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Ogando's one. Shepard's has a really live arm and he's a young guy. With, you know, I think that there's a lot of possibility. They could even sign somebody if they want to. So, Soria's got history. Soria, sure. He's so, a fantastic arm. Yeah. Based so, on Tommy John stuff, he should be better next year. I mean, that's like at least traditionally how that works out. Yeah, although he's he's talking about the, the, the stuff from the past and the mishaps and so forth. But, yeah, you know, all, all these – well, you're talking about Soria. But, yes, it's all in play, and I think it's all possible. But I don't think the Rangers would discount something like that. I, I think it's possible. If they feel that's the best option, they'll go with it. No, they've tried to go – you know, what, what, three years now we've heard they wanted to be in the rotation. Of course, in 2011, he, got, he was stuck in the bullpen. He got hurt this year, last year, this year. Didn't really know what he was going to do. It'll be interesting to see how they, how they move forward next year. I mean, he's had a, a year and a half to, to rehab from it. So when you, I, when, I hope he comes back. When you were talking about uh, starting pitchers running sprints, I immediately thought about Feliz because the knock on him was that he didn't want to do that type of work. You know, it's like... He's a young guy, and he's had a lot of success. He's like, dude, I throw hard. Why do I have to go run these sprints? What are we talking about? But a lot of times, that willingness to do that is what's going to make you, you know, a starting pitcher, frontline pitcher. I don't have intimate knowledge about that specifically, but people change. And yeah. if Feliz feels that, let's face facts, we're all motivated by similar factors, one, one of the biggest being money, and Feliz is, Feliz is going to come up for some money soon. And if he has a chance to make $70 million on the open market versus be an afterthought, sh tell, tell me how to jump. I'll jump how high, whatever. Right, like, right. he'll do it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't – unless he's some sort of uh, self-defeating person who just wants to sabotage his own career, if that problem exists, I imagine it will be addressed. So, yeah, you know, I think that – the goals of player and team tend to be aligned in that way. The way to make money is to be good. If you're good, you help your team. It should be all fine. All right. Uh, you, you've, got, you've got a couple books in the can. You've got another one coming out. And I wanna, the first thing I want to ask you is how do you decide what it is that you're going to write about? Like, you know, there's a million different things that you can write about. Do you try and get in on something as it's going this way or do you go back after the fact? How do you put that together? I've been crazy lucky. Both the Ray's book and the Expo's book were offered to me by somebody else. Neither wow. of them were my idea. Same guy. Uh, this is a great story, actually. I like this story, so I can tell this story. Also, I like to tell stories. So um, back in the 90s, before I was writing about sports at all, like on the side or anything, like um, – I used to post on an Expos message board. There used to be a site called, it was called like bulletinboards.com for a while. Then it became Fan Home. So I'd post on Fan Home all the time. And I was like a 22-year-old guy, and I was super into stats. So I'd post stats, stats. They should make this trade. This guy stinks, whatever. Some people thought, oh, that's cool. And some people were like, oh, this guy's a crazy person. Because it's like way before Moneyball or whatever. Um, the story that I told earlier today is my dad bought me my first Bill James abstract when I was eight years old. So wow. I'm, not, I'm not a normal person. <laughs> so... Um, 
okay, so I'm posting all this stuff, whatever. And, uh, and then eventually I start writing for prospectus or whatever. And I, and I stopped posting on this site. Also, message boards are not as popular as they used to be in the 90s. Now there are alternatives. Fine. Right. So I get an email in 2007 from this guy, whatever, at randomhouse.com. You don't know me, but I was AZ bullpen coach on <laughs> fanhome.com. <laughs> and now I'm an editor at Random House. Come write a book for me. And I'm like, well, which one of my friends is playing a prank on me? This is amazing. This is the best joke ever. But it was a real dude. And he's like an American who went to McGill. And he's just about my age. And we posted on the same message board. And he just thought that, I, like, he, be, I, it was, I didn't use my real name. Not that that would have meant anything in 1999 anyway. But he pieced together that I was the same person. He followed, whatever. And he liked the stuff. But it never would have happened if not for the message board business. So the Ray's book and the Expo's book. I'm going to say are all because of the brilliant things that I said as a 22-year-old on the internet in 1998. My handle was Jonesy Jones. <laughs> and, uh, hey, uh, what is the name of the Expos book? So it's called Up, Up, and Away. And uh, we already started selling it on Amazon and all that stuff. And I'm very nearly done with it. Like, as soon as this trip is over, I'm going home. I have a short time off with Granlin. I'm going to finish it, and it'll be great. And it's coming out in March. And I interviewed like 130 people. And I think most people just don't have a strong opinion one way or the other about the Expos. But I interviewed Pedro Martinez and Larry Walker and Tim Raines and Andre Dawson and Rusty Staub and Dennis Martinez and Cliff Floyd. And they're so interesting. They're just, and they just, they don't, because the team is dead and they don't have a vested interest one way or another, they're being really candid. Cliff Floyd, we talked, I had breakfast with him for two hours and he's telling, he had this horrific wrist injury in 1995. It's like the worst thing you've ever seen. And he's a 21 year old kid and he's telling, he's like crying over breakfast. This big guy, athletic guy. So we're talking about all this stuff and, and he's just, he's giving me these details that are amazing. And, uh, and there's just a lot of stuff like that in the book. Just really great perspective. The, um, and then they made my editor, because he knows I'm a big Expos fan or whatever, he said, put some of yourself in there too, which I never do. I don't really, I'm not like that. But because of the Expos connection, so maybe 5% of the book is a little bit of a fan book, especially once you get to a certain number of years, which are really in my wheelhouse, like late 80s on into the 90s and all that. 94, God, there's a lot. So it, it has that reflection too. So I just think it's, it'll be entertaining to read even if you don't care that much about it because it's just, it's very vivid. There's just cool quotes. I talk about like politics in the province of Quebec in the 70s. You'd be like, why the hell would I want to read about that? But it's super interesting and related to the topic, I think. And so I, I feel like people are going to dig it and it's very, it's eclectic, it's different, it looks cool. I've seen the pagination. We have like, there's like a sidebar, like a three-page sidebar about baseball terms in French. How did they invent baseball terms in French? There were none. So I talked to the dudes who invented it and they talked me through this long story and La uh, Recour and Voltigeur de Centre and all this stuff. And it's amazingly interesting and no other team has this stuff. They're a very unique team. The Jays are from Toronto too, but they could be an American team. The Expos were, for better or for worse, different than any club that has ever existed and my job is to tell the story of this different team. That sounds very, very cool. You know, uh, do you want to jump in, Augustine? When you're done. Okay, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to hit this because you brought it up earlier, uh, how Twitter just has changed things because the night that you guys were in bankruptcy, we were down and covering Cowboys camp, and we were following it on our phones. We were following it on Twitter. And it's inter that's like one of the five greatest Twitter nights of my life is just I can remember like all the you know local writers are down in San Antonio at Cowboys camp, and then, you know, the guy who did the radio show with Ben was like, looking at Twitter, goes, oh, my God, they did it. They got the Rangers. And all these drunk journalists are jumping up and down in this hotel bar in San Antonio <laughs> because you guys won the auction. And so I'm just, I'm just curious about, do you even remember enjoying sports before? Like, can you even go back in time? Because Twitter is so wrapped up in pretty much everything that we do now. I'm assuming you guys consume games and stuff the same way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm a little older than you guys. I'm 52. But I mean, I remember when uh, I mean, I would live to get the sporting news. The sporting news was the baseball Bible. It was completely baseball centric. It was it was baseball America. Right. You know, and uh, live for it. And, and the back of it would have all the stats. And of course, they'd be hopelessly out of date. But that that was, you know, that, that's what constituted immediacy, you know. And my goal as a little kid was I thought it'd be really cool that when I died to get my obituary in the back of. <laughs> 
sporting news. You know, that, 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 that's really making it in the sports industry. Now that'd be depressing. Um, now, yeah, well, exactly. But then in 85, I just gotten out of law school and I was in a rotisserie baseball league. And I mean, the whole thing had only been around for a couple of years. Well, there were no computer programs to, to run that. So what we do is we'd have one, we, you could only change your roster once a month and you would make trades or, you know, waiver picks or whatever. You wouldn't even know how you had done in the preceding month until that upcoming month was almost over. So, and I would go to lunch every day. You know, it was early in my league. I go to lunch and I would go through the box scores and try to ca- tabulate how everyone else in the league was doing. You know, and so anyhow, the fact that everything's available and it's so immediate, it, it is completely different. It changes the way franchises are run. It obviously changes, you know, uh, I mean, a lot about how people have to really watch themselves and be careful. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to keep anything discreet anymore, so it's different. But it's just the way it is. It, By the way, can, can I tell one real quick Elvis Myrtle Beach story? Of course. Okay, so Elvis. My first full season with Myrtle Beach was 2007. Elvis was the top prospect for the Braves. He was 17 or 18 years old on opening day. And um, so uh, after the opener, um, I go to, back to the manager's office. Rocket Wheeler is a terrific guy. And Rocket is absolutely verbally dressing down Elvis because he didn't run out of pop fly. And the, the, the payoff to this uh, you know, harangue he's delivering against him was he fined him 60 bucks, which in the Carolina League is like Fort Knox. I mean, that is a lot of money. So now fast forward three years, and uh, uh, we, we signed the deal to buy the Rangers. Uh, there's that development camp going on. John Blake wants me to meet the media. But before that, or actually I do that, and then I go around, and I'm talking to the players and saying hello. And uh, uh, Salty, Jared Salamaki, he played in Myrtle Beach, so I'm talking to Salty. Uh, and I talked to Elvis, and, you know, we're kind of laughing. I mean, who would have thought, you know, three years earlier? So he said, uh, did we meet on opening day? And I said, yeah. He said, was I being fined? And I said, yeah, you were. He goes, man, that was bad. He goes, 60 bucks, that was a lot of money. <laughs> so now fast forward three more years. It's opening day this season, and I'm flying to Myrtle Beach, and uh, I'm looking on Twitter, and I see that Elvis has signed his new, you know, nine-figure contract. So I texted him. I said, I'm thinking back to opening day six years ago. You come a long way. I'm proud of you. And he, he got back right away and said, yeah, but 60 bucks was a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. I, I, uh, I want to get your, your take on Twitter because I feel like you being here and sitting on this couch and then, you know, the whole paranoid fan thing, it's, just, it's, it's changed so much. You know, I was watching your interaction with Michael Gruber. Everyone here loves Grubes, and he's – Tweet Grooves is like this Twitter Ranger phenomenon. It's like, are you able to uh, are you able to watch games without Twitter, or do you suddenly start looking around, going, well, "Shit, where's my where's my Twitter?" You know, c- can you distance from it, or is it like too much a part of everything now? Well, it's more fun. Number one, and number two, it informs what I do. The thing is, like, it's as if everybody's in the room with me. So if I'm if I want to know about I don't know the way a guy's pitching or whatever. I've got like pit like Harry Pavlidis is online and Dan Brooks and they're talking about pitch FX stuff and I follow them and I could just read their stuff. That's fine. Or if I want to, let's say the Rangers are playing the Tigers. Okay. Well, I follow like Jason Beck, who's a B writer for the Tigers is really good. And he might have this particular perspective on this that I just don't know because I, fo- I follow all 30 teams. I have there's no way I can have as much knowledge about the Rangers as whoever the best Rangers beat writer is. It's impossible. So that all helps a lot. And, uh, yeah, I just feel like it's great. And, honestly, the other thing for me on a personal level is I work from home, but I'm a really social guy. And I work in Denver, which is not near anything at all. It's, like, not near anything. And uh, and I go to different cities, and I meet people who in real life who I knew on Twitter, and now we're friends, and it's amazing. And uh, so I just feel that that all ties into it. So, yeah, you know, the only thing I'll say is the last, since the World Series ended, uh, well, today I tweeted a couple of things, but the three or four days before that, I tweeted one thing total, which was that I was at a Longhorns game. And other than that, I was off Twitter, hook them, or, or, or boomer sooner, or whatever the hell you want. I don't, I'm a Canadian, I don't care about any of this stuff. And uh, you're all crazy to me. But um, yeah, and, and I'll tell you that as much as I love Twitter, those three or four days off was pretty good. I was just hanging out with my friends and having beers or whatever. And I was like, this is all right, actually. I could, I could Vacations from Twitter are good, too. But the other 362 days a year, oh, sure. I, I really, I rely on it heavily, and it, it expands my knowledge base. And it's, it's important. It's very important for my job, I think. Very cool how it kind of shrinks the world. What you want to jump in, Augustine? So whenever you guys are uh, done. We're just jamming. I think 
We were going to go mingle like 20 minutes ago, and then we just started getting, getting off on this other thing. Here. Hey, I appreciate everything going on tonight. You guys did a tremendous job. Let's give another guys another round of applause. Give it up. Huge. We've had six meetups so far. This beats all of them, hands down, bar none, the best. Appreciate everything you guys did tonight. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, you guys want to buy Chuck and Jonah body shots? They're ready. Oh, okay, good. I just came from Austin. We're done. There's no more shots. <laughs>